Hello and welcome to The Art of Action, a comprehensive look at the art and inspiration behind the award-winning Pistol Whip VR. My name is Jonathan Hackett. I'm the art lead at Cloudhead Games. I've been working in games for over 20 years, and for the last five, I've been focused exclusively on VR at Cloudhead. Hello, I'm Sarah Rowland, the 3D generalist at Cloudhead Games. I've been working in VR and AR for the past six years and have around nine years of experience in the games industry. Today, we'll be taking you through some of the history for our art process behind Pistol Whip and how it has evolved over time. For those not familiar with our game, Pistol Whip is a VR shooting game that merges rhythm elements with frenetic action movie gameplay. Pistol Whip released in November of 2019 on Quest and PC VR, and later on PSVR. Our latest update to the game just released on August 12th, simultaneously on all platforms, which is a big first for the team that we're very proud of. With it, we introduced our second cinematic campaign, Smoke and Thunder. We also introduced our new styles system, which allows players to fully customize their weapon types and modifiers. We also completely overhauled our menu systems, as well as introduced a ton of other general fixes and polish items to the rest of the game. At the end of 2018, Cloudhead had just come off of spending the better part of a year working with Valve to create Aperture Hand Labs, which was a demo designed to show off the features of Valve's new index controllers. Naturally, at this point, discussions started around what our next project was going to be. We had several game ideas already ready to go. However, after revisiting those ideas and putting some thought into the state of the VR market at the time, we decided to switch directions. We knew we wanted to create an arcade-style game that was easy to pick up and was centered around delivering an action movie power fantasy. Specifically, we wanted to focus on the type of action for more modern action movies like Baby Driver, John Wick, and Atomic Blonde. These movies, and especially the trailers for those movies, have a very rhythmic quality to them, where the action is synced up with the music in the background. This gives them a fun, stylish, dance-like quality that we thought would be really cool to translate into physical VR gameplay. Perhaps most importantly, though, we knew that the Oculus Quest was going to be coming to market, and we thought it was very important to target this new platform with our next release. Since we knew the Oculus Quest would be a large market for us, we needed to make sure the game would not only look good, but also perform well on the hardware. The Quest isn't as powerful as a $2,000 custom-built PC, which ultimately meant we couldn't have things like dynamic lighting and shadows, and our assets needed to be low-poly as well. The visual fidelity of the head-mounted display is another important consideration. VR highlights imperfection in your visuals, so committing to a realistic art style was, well, unrealistic, especially for a small team that needs to prototype quickly. Thus, Pistol Whip's colorful Fever Dream art style was born. We can pump up the colors, have enemies on floating platforms, and do all sorts of things that don't really make sense in real life, but work in the game. The details in the environment don't get in the way of the action either, and that's important for a fast game like ours. If you've ever played or developed for VR, you'll know that motion sickness is a huge issue that needs to be addressed whenever you're making something for that medium. The way a player moves is always a problem that needs to be solved for any experience in VR. Our solution for Pistol Whip was to have the player move straight forward at a linear speed that never changes. This means that there is always a straight path for the player to traverse, grounding them in the world. Artistically speaking, this can create some interesting visuals with symmetry or large chasms with just a narrow walkway. While there are many aspects of the game's overall aesthetics that we'd like to go into, today we're just going to be focusing on the game's levels. Pistol Whip purposefully does not have any direct representation of the player, such as hand presence. The game really comes down to the guns, the enemies, and then the level itself. So, aside from the campaign modes that we eventually added, which we'll get to later, the levels themselves are largely what tells the story in Pistol Whip. As mentioned, our inspiration came from modern action movies like Atomic Blonde and John Wick. But Cloudhead also has a collective love for classic action movies from the 80s and 90s. So we obviously started to collect tons of reference for set dressing and architecture from big action set pieces from those types of movies, as well as some other general color and vibe reference from video games, graphic design, art, things like that. We also collected a bunch of cinema palette reference. Ultimately, I found that this was very useful for quickly finding pre-palletized color combinations to use in the levels that acted as callbacks to the movies that we were referencing. We organized things into folders based on look sets with names like nightclub, warehouse, parking garage, casino, etc. 
We worked with a Canadian record label, Cannibalin, and were able to secure 10 songs that we were going to turn into levels for launch. For each of the levels, design and art would sit down and listen to the songs as a group, and we would discuss what kind of imagery the songs were summoning up in our minds. Taking that, we would then draw from our pool of desired set pieces and inspirations, and we would take them and start laying them out in a sequence of encounters. I think it's worth pointing out here that we knew pretty early on with Pistol Whip that we were not going to be caring too much about spatial continuity. We were moving the player in a linear direction at a set speed, and we absolutely did not want to be dealing with elevation changes or drastic scene transitions. We knew from the start, when planning out levels, that we were not going to get overly concerned about going from, for example, a rooftop setting straight into a casino, and then from there straight into an underground parking garage and into a bank and so on. We also were not necessarily worried about conveying any kind of explicit narrative at this point, per se. We were just hoping that players would pick up on all of the action tropes and homages that we were building into the levels. So we're not going to go into all the ins and outs of our tools here. However, it is definitely worth mentioning that Pistol Whip was a classic example of build the plane as you fly it. Early on, we started building levels out with lots of manually created geometry, but we quickly realized that this was going to be far too work intensive and take us way too long to create levels. It was also very inflexible for gameplay iteration and such. So our gameplay lead, Cameron, developed the procedural generation tool that we're still using to this day. It worked wonders for helping us get levels up and running extremely quickly, and it also added to our abstract aesthetic. We also found with certain levels that by cranking some of those proc gen settings up to ridiculous levels, we were able to craft some really cool abstract dreamlike settings that were less literal than some of our more action movie oriented levels. Initial levels took two or three weeks, with some of them being revisited multiple times as the tools matured. Another thing that I want to bring up quickly here is that the levels being represented by movie posters in the menus was a fairly late addition to the game. In our initial playtest, we were finding that players went into Pistol Whip looking for very strict rhythm game mechanics, and they were frustrated by Pistol Whip's more open-ended gameplay. We were confident that we were onto something unique with Pistol Whip, though, so we put some thought into what was causing this disconnect with playtesters. The idea came up to present each level not as a song, but as a little mini-movie that the player was going to be taking part in, and to do that in-game by representing each level with its own stylized movie poster. Once we had this stood up, we found that framing our levels as scenes instead of songs reset players' expectations and let them better grasp what we were trying to do with our gameplay. Now, there's a couple of reasons I bring this up. The first is that the posters for the initial 10 launch levels were fairly easy to figure out, specifically because of those initial kickoff meetings that design and art had. At the time, we were really only talking through the fiction of the levels as a sort of means to an end. But the result of that initial work was that the levels had enough baked-in personality and narrative to them that the posters fell into place fairly naturally. The second reason is, from that point going forward, instead of just thinking of the levels as a series of set pieces, we shifted our thinking more toward them being narrative experiences right from the start. And because of this, as a team, we started collectively thinking more and more about Pistol Whip's potential to tell stories. At any rate, we hit our planned release date in November 2019 with 10 unique levels. The game was very well received, we got lots of good reviews, and lots of positive player feedback. And importantly, the game sold well which was encouraging for the future of Pistol Whip. By the time we shipped the base game, we already had five more songs from Cannibal and ready to go. We had tapped our initial set piece bucket and we were wanting to try some new stuff with these five levels. Plus at that point, we were more comfortable with the tools and we felt like we knew what Pistol Whip's identity was. Additionally, toward the end of the base game, we had started to insert some moving elements into some of the levels, which really brought things to life. So for some of these levels, we started considering those types of things from the start. These levels were a little more experimental in nature. Instead of a series of action movie trope set pieces, each level was more based on like an elevator pitch for a movie, kind of a nugget of an idea. And then we just extrapolated from there. At this point, we knew Pistol Whip was going to have a long tail and that we knew that we wanted to take things into some new interesting directions. So we started to expand and grow the team. This brings us to the Heartbreaker update. The team started on the Heartbreaker pack to break from the hardcore EDM music that the game was known for and branch into something more chill. It came out during the first summer of the pandemic when finding a way to relax was more important than ever. It was also the first multi-scene pack that Cloud had released, featuring three levels. The idea was for the scenes to be even more abstract than regular pistol whip scenes and change the overall aesthetic. One way we did this was to write a shader to render mesh edges and move towards a neon outrun look. 
These scenes also turned out to be more focused on emotions rather than action movie tropes like the ones before. I was a new artist on the team, and this is my first foray into working on environments in the game. I was quite intimidated, but I was also very excited to work on this pack. It was an aesthetic that I loved, and it honestly felt like a guilty pleasure to have a job making abstract environments with my favorite colors. Because I was new and the Songs for Heartbreaker pack had lyrics, I focused on them in order to gain inspiration and create a story for each scene, which I will go over a bit later. I also brought my visual effects expertise to the team, which meant I could add more dynamic elements like shooting stars, fires, and fireworks. Those fireworks have a tendency to make people tear up, by the way. I've heard people say it reminds them of an amazing music festival experience that they had, and I think that's wonderful. The concept behind letting go was how the passage of time feels after a breakup or a loss. The sun sets, it's night, and you gaze sadly at the moon in the rain, and then eventually another day begins. The world keeps moving. Embers was more about the foggy memories of a nightclub or a party from the night before that you went to in order to forget painful memories or to just have fun. And finally, Another Day is about the journey to experience joy again. More literally, the scene illustrates going through a road trip where you happen to pass through town having a festival. So, going back a bit, by the time we shipped the base game, we already knew that we wanted to do levels based on different genres of music in Pistol Whip. So, over holiday 2019 and into the beginning of 2020, we were imagining what sort of different levels and artwork would go along with these new music genres i.e. what types of action movie set pieces would go along with metal and industrial music, or some upbeat rock and rockabilly, things like that. One of those ideas that we kept internally calling Chill and Kill is what eventually turned into the Heartbreaker pack that Sarah just talked about. The more we thought about how the genre of music could alter the locations, but also the enemy types and weapons and such, the more we realized that if we just broadened our scope, we could make entire stories and worlds around some of these ideas. So, the conversations shifted a bit more as we worked on Reloaded and Heartbreaker. Instead of thinking of music first and world building second, we changed to thinking of narrative first and then what types of music would best support those narratives. So with that, we went all the way and turned a couple of our ideas into what we called action packs. Our first campaign, or action pack, was 2089, a science fiction story full of vibrant colors and new mechanics. Even though the idea had been in the works for a while, it still felt like a bit of a risk. However, we are a narrative-loving studio, and what's better than working on what you love? Since we were adding a story, we had to figure out how that worked for Pistol Whip. We ended up adding voiceovers to each scene and adding interstitial animatics drawn by the very skilled Eco Osseo. We also added a boss battle. The fans wanted a boss, we wanted a boss, so we knew we had to make it happen in this pack. Another completely new element for the game, we spent a fair amount of time prototyping in order to get it just right. In order to keep some semblance of continuity between the scenes, we added parts of the interstitial art to the beginnings and endings of each level to make them feel more connected. This example you see here is at the end of scene 4, The Nest, where you stumble upon the metal core controlling the AI on the planet. For this particular section of the level, we actually modeled this room after Figo had drawn the comic panel even though sometimes it was the other way around, where we sent reference from what we'd already made for the game. Adding parts of the level to the animatics between them and vice versa not only provided a better flow, but it added depth to the experience as well, giving the player a chance to truly live through the story. Because we had five scenes to tell a whole narrative, we could expand on the action movie tropes that we would draw from as well, giving us more freedom to create in-depth scenes that told one chapter of a larger story. In 2089, you're fighting back against machines that have trapped you, ending up getting captured and brought to a decrepit hospital taken over by robots, then to a supercomputer and intense boss fight in the sky, all to seek revenge and discover what's truly going on. Since this was the first time we had a boss in Pistol Whip, we wanted to make its reveal as dramatic as possible. We timed big hangar doors to open right on an intense part of the music, and then it starts shooting these huge strings of bullets at you. Part of the challenge in making the boss was that it needed a whole new set of tools. It hadn't been incorporated into the procedural generation for the geometry that we had, so we actually had to cut out sections ourselves. This resulted in a fair amount of iteration between the design team and the art team to make sure the boss wasn't clipping into any of the environment. All of this work resulted in the ending of 2089 to be so intense that a lot of people feel quite emotional at the end of it. I know the entire team is incredibly proud of this pack and its impact on our fans, and because of that, it meant that we could continue adding stories to our game. So we got to work on another one. 
Smoke and Thunder. Our second action pack with another five whole new scenes has a Wild West theme, which added horses, a train, and other fun elements to the update. A lot of visual development went into Smoke and Thunder. We wanted to have a storm in at least one of the levels, and we were able to get some great atmospheric moments because of that. The team also wanted to have more of the environment moving. We were hoping to have player-triggered destruction, but unfortunately that became beyond the scope of this update. However, we did get an exploding water tower, minecarts, and tumbleweeds in. And of course, we had to make our boss even cooler than the last one, so it's a mechanical scorpion. I'll show you a screenshot later. One of the biggest challenges for this pack was getting the different forms of lightning to look good and perform well on Quest. We had ambient environmental lighting, lightning strikes, an arc from the boss, and electricity shooting from the newest gun type, the boomstick. Lightning usually looks better with a bit of bloom, but since we still need to avoid textures or effects with transparency, which bloom has, I focused more on the color and behavior of the effect in order to make it look good. The water tower was made using a physics simulation that I captured in Unity, as well as some well-timed visual effects. We may not have been able to get player-triggered environment destruction in the game, but we were able to get our exploding barrels moving around on minecarts, which added some interesting timing puzzles to the levels in this pack. We really pushed ourselves with this campaign. Within the five levels, we added way more effects, animations, and new types of locations for Pistol Whip. The cave and canyons were an interesting challenge because we wanted them to feel more organic, and less like the building blocks of other scenes in Pistol Whip. We mostly accomplished this by placing large organic rock assets made by our modeler, Matt. Like 2089, since we had five scenes with which to tell our story, we were able to pack classic western tropes into Smoke and Thunder. We have a saloon brawl, a desert storm, a mine, a train heist, and, of course, our lovely scorpion boss. We joked about making a scorpion boss early on, and I don't think Jonathan or I thought it would actually happen, but it did. Honestly, I'm glad we were able to get it in because it's super cool and adds a lot to Smoke and Thunder. The team actually made a great trailer demonstrating all of the updates to the game since launch, so we thought it would be great to show it off here. Please enjoy everything new in Pistol Whip. Hey everyone, I'm Avalon Penrose, and I play Tess in the latest Pistol Whip campaign. And this is everything new in Pistol Whip. First up, Smoke and Thunder, the latest action-packed campaign from the minds that brought you 2089. Shoot your boomsticks through a reimagining the Wild West with new mechanics, enemies, horses, a new boss, and a badass story about two sisters battling it out. Oh, and you also fight on a train. That's right, a rootin' tootin' train. Cloudhead has poured everything into this latest campaign, reinventing the Pistol Whip experience once again. While your legs are burning from dodging explosive barrels that were flung at your head at 300 miles an hour... <laughs> We'll move on over to the style system. With Pistol Whip Styles, Cloudhead has introduced modifiers that change your experience completely. And they're giving you the keys to do it. Pick and choose how to change the mechanics of the game. Adjust the experience at the snap of your fingers. Or rather, at the pull of a trigger. Want big heads for easy headshots? Check. How about bullet mayhem to really challenge your friends? Check. The possibilities are endless. Literally in the millions. And if you end up creating a combination of modifiers that hasn't been tried before, a leaderboard is created and you can challenge others to try to beat your best score. Styles completely transforms the game and gives it endless replayability. Speaking of which, how much is there to do in Pistol Whip since its release in 2019? Well, since you asked, Pistol Whip launched with 10 scenes, each with a unique environment, song, story, and tone focused on replayability. But Cloudhead has since added to that number to bring it up to 28 scenes, with over 30 different weapons, skins, and more, all included in regular free updates. There has never been a better time to try out Pistol Whip. So what are you waiting for? Saddle up with Smoke and Thunder and Pistol Whip Styles when it releases on August 12th, 2021. In conclusion, the team defined our hardware and platform constraints early on and designed the art in the game to fit within the limits. We found ways to support the gameplay through high contrast enemies and colorful visuals to immerse the player in music. We kept ourselves open to new ideas, experimented, and continued to pursue ways to improve the game that we would personally enjoy, which has ended up working very well for us. We found stories to tell through the environments based on our songs and our favorite movie tropes, and that kept us inspired, pushing for more in the game.
So thank you for your time. We hope you found this interesting. We had a lot of fun making it and we're still having a lot of fun creating new stuff in Pistol Whip. So yeah, check us out. If you'd like to know some more behind the scenes insight into Pistol Whip, look for the DevCom talk from Cameron Oltman, our gameplay lead, about the pillars of Pistol Whip and how they helped shape the game. If you want to know about how we created Pistol Whip's amazing community, check out the DevCom talk from our community guru, Ashley Riot. And if you'd like to hear about managing a remote team during COVID, Check out the talk from our executive producer, Ed Lago, at the Game Devs of Color conference. Thanks, everybody. Take care.